I was told I can remove this, so don't worry, I've not broken the system. <laughs> So, first thing I want to say very quickly is this is my story, I'm autistic, everyone is an individual, so please do not take anything I say as gospel truth, everyone is different. Now, starting in the beginning, I am autistic, I was diagnosed autistic around seven or eight years old whilst I was in primary school. When I was preparing to do talks and starting this out, I decided to ask my mother, what was the first sign you had that you believed I was autistic? And she said, well... In year two in primary school, there was a race, and the idea of the race was you ran from the start line to a bucket to the line. At the bucket, you found a pair of matching socks, hung them up, and kept running. Easy. So, race begins, my mother's waiting on the other end, we all go, then the first kid comes through, second kid comes through, third kid comes through, I'm still not there, I was one of the tallest, one of the fastest kids, where am I? I'm still at the bucket. I'm looking for those socks. I have a red one, a blue one, a pink one, a yellow one. They do not match. They have given me a bucket of odd socks. So I'm sat there looking for socks, shouting, they're cheating, they're cheating, how dare they? And that was the first sign my mama had where she was like, maybe he's autistic. Thanks, mum. I love you a lot. From there, I ended up being in a private primary school. So in a private primary school, it was small classes, individuals, a lot of the things I had, a lot of traits weren't really noticed because I could be easily accommodated due to the close support of teachers. And the fact that we were like seven or eight in a class, that was pretty small, you know? I can get the attention I needed. So I went through school, did that in primary, and then my parents broke up. So that day, I was sat with my parents at a bowling alley, and I remember asking them, are you two getting a divorce? They hadn't said anything at that point. I just guessed. And when they said, well, yes, mummy and daddy are separating. We love you very much. I felt it was my fault. Because I know I'd been a bit of a problem child at home. I'd been a pain. I hadn't understood my own emotions, my own needs. But then at the time, I didn't have a diagnosis. I wasn't aware that I actually was allowed to not understand this because it wasn't something that I couldn't do because I just couldn't, because I wasn't trying, it was because I genuinely couldn't at that time. It was something that I would learn later and I did. When I started off then, I was very upset, I had to move school. So I was suddenly from a class of six with people I know, people I love, people I trusted, who I'd been with since nursery, I'm now in a mainstream primary school with 30 odd kids in a class, shouting, screaming, noise, chaos. You can guess that it wasn't long before I started to feel really, really bad. I was trying to walk around, trying to stand up, and the teacher would just go, sit down, shut up, look straight. Why? Why did I have to do that? They would come over to me when they'd ask me a question multiple times, and they'd say, look me in the eyes and answer. I can look you in the eyes or I can answer. I couldn't do both. And if I said that, I got in trouble. I had to go sit outside, I had to wait. I was getting in trouble for being me, something that intrinsically at the time, I didn't know was an issue and I couldn't change because I'm a child, I was six or seven. It's not my job. I'm supposed to be having fun, learning who I am, not worrying about straight back, having to ask to go to the toilet. The amount of times I wet myself was ridiculous. And that was just because I was too anxious to ask. I don't wet myself anymore, I assure you. <laughs> so, once diagnosis starts coming around, I've already started to feel a loss of my humanity, a loss of my individuality, because I'd been taken from an environment where I felt free, where I felt like I was myself, to basically being in a rat race. So I sat down and got in the car, went to diagnosis, went to the first session, and the receptionist said hello. She called me by my name. She didn't ask me to look her in the eye. She didn't ask me to behave. She didn't ask me to stand still. She didn't ask me to not talk about what I was interested in. She wanted to get to know me, which was nice. Then my anxiety decreased. I went into the interview rooms or consultation rooms and I had had a bad day that day. I'd been bullied, I'd been mocked. I'm the different kid, of course I was. I was easy prey because I didn't know. So there I am and I've had it. I have a meltdown, I hide under the chair. Now at this point in my brain I'm going, 
I'm going to get shouted at, I'm going to get screamed at, I'm in so much trouble, oh my god, I'm going to die. Then I hear rustling, I look over, and a lady who was frankly a little bit too large to be getting under the chair opposite me is getting under the chair opposite me. And she just sits there, and we talk. We do the entire session, basically, with her sat under a chair opposite me. I really think she should have had a table in hindsight, but it's fun. I feel like a human. I've learned something. And then I go back to school and everything becomes harder again. But I've had a taste of individuality again. I feel hopeful. Now, time for fast forwards a bit. My parents are still separated. Everything's difficult around there. And it's the day of my final diagnosis. It's the day I get the little bit of paper that says, you are autistic. Great. I'm playing on the playground. It's break time. I'm walking around, having a fun time. Someone says my name. I turn around, and they knock me out with a rock. Point blank, slam me in the head. Why? Because I deserved it, apparently. Because I was a disruption to the class. Because I was different. I deserved to be physically assaulted. Now, no one apparently saw the incident, so the kid didn't get in trouble, but I remember waking up on the floor, looking upwards with a few staff crowded around me, a bit concerned, and then my mum picking me up going, oh God, that's a bruise. Had a mark for a few days, which wasn't much fun. So, I then get my diagnosis. I have my bit of paper, my mother starts the statementing process, everything's fine. I now know what I am. I now know that it's not my fault. I can improve, and I'm going to, because I am very stubborn. If you know me, I do not like to be told something I can't do, unless it's the UK law, in which case I won't violate that, because I don't like prison. <laughs> so I am now under have a better understanding of who I am, what I am, what I can do, what I can't do. So I start reading, I start learning. I get a book, which my mother found for me, which was, all cats have autism. Adorable, I now feel like a little cat. Maybe not the best idea, thanks, Mum. <laughs> Purring was not a good idea. So I have this book, I've learned who I am a little bit, and I start continuing. Then I meet a supposed professional, this was a GP, I think, not a psychologist, who told me, you are autistic. That means three limitations. You will never be able to work in the public sector or interact with people. You will never be able to maintain a lasting friendship. You will never find love. I was eight. <laughs> I still thought girls were icky. I didn't want love. But no friends, no career. So I threw myself into science because what else am I supposed to do? I wanted to help people. I love people. But I was told I could never work publicly, I could never interact with people, so who am I to argue with the big, smart doctor who's, you know, gone through medical school, they know what they're on about, I must be wrong, I'm eight. So I keep going, and I finish through school, do quite well, and get into secondary school. Now at this point, my mother has won full custody of me, so I've moved back with her, which means I've gone from Burnham to Bracknell. I'm the only kid at my school wearing a purple jumper. I've gone from a school of 240, which originally I was at a school of 60, to now a school of over 1,200. This is where I first start experiencing sensory overload, where I start genuinely getting issues. I remember being sat in my maths class one day, and the teacher had stepped out for a minute to talk to one of the other teachers. The noise behind me, I could hear the pencil scratching from someone two rows back. I could then see the light in the front corner start flickering. I was then suddenly aware of the whiteboard, the fact that there was a wave shimmering across it. Every tiny detail, even the breath of the person sat next to me, I was suddenly massively aware of. And then I lost control. I felt myself sort of moved back in my own head. It's as if I wasn't controlling myself. Someone touched my shoulder and it felt like a burning pain. I'd never felt this before, so I screamed. Why did it hurt? I ran out the classroom and one of the teachers grabbed hold of me to make sure I was okay. Across my ribs, I just felt like I'd burst into flame. I desperately tried to push myself away from them to get away, but I couldn't. 
And then I started shouting at them, screaming, and in my head I was saying, stop, Connor, stop, sit down, behave. Why are you doing this? This isn't you. And yet it was me. I was being pushed to this by a sensory system I didn't understand at the time. Now, to clarify, on the first day of year seven, the Senko brought me into her office. A big, intimidating lady. Actually, she's only about yay tool, but when you're, you know, just a year seven and you're like, yay tool, she's big. And she said to me, and I will always remember this, you have come to this school and you have a statement. The statement entitles you to a certain amount of support. Now, I'm going to do one better. I'm going to stand here and I'm going to make you an offer. I will stay in this school until the day you graduate, as long as you promise you are going to do your best to graduate with me. This was a lady who was about two years away from retirement age. I'd started in year seven. You know that that's quite a trek, and I was likely going for A-levels. This lady, who I had just met, promised me that she doesn't see me as a lesser, she doesn't see me as an inferior, she doesn't see me as a student or a child or anything. She sees me as her partner in a journey. Someone who is there to learn, and she will learn with me. I just burst into tears in her office, and she kept her promise. Her husband's health started ailing when I was in the first year of A-levels, and she was still there. Her husband's health deteriorated even more when I was in my first year of A-levels again due to depression. She was still there. And then she had to come up to me and say, I'm so sorry, Connor, I cannot stay anymore. I need to look after my husband. And I just... I just hugged her and said, do what you need. You've looked after me for the last eight years. You're amazing. And that's what I believe they should be there. But I'm digressing now, and I'm going to jump back in time again. So here we go. Back to year four, comma. Little boy, I have a book. I have a mission. I'm writing notes. I'm making notes on every single person in my class. Now, that sounds creepy. I promise you it's not. I'm learning how to interact. I'm writing down what they say, what they do to each other, how they have a good interaction, because I knew happy, I knew sad. That was it. If you weren't happy, you were sad. If you weren't sad, you were happy. Done. And a lot of people, when they're younger, do think in black and white. I still sometimes do, but I'm learning to stop that. So because I had a black and a white system, I needed to learn, and I watched interactions, and I made notes, and then I would ask the teacher, I would ask other people. So for example, John and Sue might be talking, John says something, Sue leaves crying. Obviously, John has been a bit rude. He's been mean. How dare he? Actually, Sue's dog died last week, and he was just offering his condolences, and she was crying because she was happy someone cared. But I didn't know that. So I kept going. I kept making notes, and I kept continuing through the process because I needed to understand, and I would share with close teachers. Then when I got to secondary school, I tried to make a few friends because I was the kid from, you know, far away. I was different. I needed to make sure I understood what I was doing. And I know you need friends to survive as a teenager. Didn't work. I had a couple. I lost them. And I started going through depression properly. Coupled with my sensory issues, coupled with the fact that I was now incredibly lonely, I couldn't talk to people, I was a bloke, I'm a man. You know what they say, boys don't cry, go have a drink, all that sort of stuff. I don't drink, I despise alcohol. But you're welcome to if you like, there's no alcohol here though, I'm afraid. So I was sat there <coughs> alone, depression kicked in, and that made my anxiety worse. So going to school became a chore. Getting my GCSEs became a chore. Speaking to people became a chore. Existing felt like a chore. And a lot of the time, I was mocked in my class was for being the smart one, the one who knows what they're on about, the one who's the teacher's pet, Mr. Know-it-all. So what do you do if you don't understand social interaction and you don't understand the norms? You try to become dumber. This part of my skull here is actually thicker from where I've cracked it open from self-harming before. Because I felt if I didn't, and I stayed the intelligent one, I wouldn't have friends. I felt that's what was wrong with me. I didn't understand at the time that they were judgmental, they were teenagers, it's what they do, it's how they interact. I just felt alone and scared, so I tried to do the only thing I could to be more normal. It was foolish, but when you're desperate, sometimes a foolish act looks like the right one. I waited a bit more time, and eventually I ended up getting excluded from school temporarily because 
I've been a problem. It's understandable, they can't keep me there forever. This was around year nine, when my depression was at its height. The place they sent me, they had no need to send me support, no need to help me settle. It was an entirely separate, isolated unit, which was supposed to look after you, teach you. The Senko, who I mentioned, personally visited me at least once a week, which was impressive because it was a 45 minute drive from the school. How she made the time, I don't know. I can only think she worked into the evening now that I see the workloads they have. She sent an LSA every day, which was part of my statement money anyway, but that exceeded it, I'm sure. She must have found budget from elsewhere. I wouldn't have been surprised if she paid for fuel out of her own pocket, knowing her. And when I came back to school in the start of year 10, start of GCSEs, I was welcomed back by everyone. I felt included again. I sat down, did my GCSEs, got 11 of them, three A stars, four A's, four B's. I was happy, I'd done it. But I still didn't have any real friends. I still didn't quite understand about it. So I started my A-levels friendless. And for the first year, my depression hit me really hard because A-levels is a massive jump from GCSEs. And when you're autistic, when you don't have friends, I had to do all the lab work myself. Have you ever tried doing a three-person titration on your own in chemistry? Do you know how annoying it is trying to hold a pipette with one hand, trying to hold a Bunsen burner with the other? You're not supposed to hold them, but I had to in order to get the angle of the flame right, because otherwise it wouldn't have worked. As I just didn't have enough apparatus to use. It was very irritating. And then, on my second time through, I met someone who I'm just going to call E. Just to make it easy, because I want to keep her identity concealed, although she probably wouldn't mind, but, you know, confidentiality. E became my best friend. Now, she had no reason to, but later I found out that she had met me when I was nine years old at Legoland. I had helped her build a car in like a little build a car area and race it because she didn't understand the basic principles of physics. She still didn't at A-levels. I was quite upset with her. <laughs> but she became my best friend and she had wanted to talk to me for years. Someone who wanted to know me. What is this? And I found a lot of the lower years had felt the same towards me because they'd always seen me hanging out with teachers, always seen me in the science block, they thought I was smart, I was cool. As my year thought I was, well, an idiot. They hated me, a lot of them. So E and I start spending more time together. I now have a place to sit at lunch rather than in a small room on my own, which was just staring at four walls. I'm now sat in the art department watching her paint as we chat and laugh. I now have a circle of friends, I have a group of different people, I have a life. <laughs> I feel like I'm starting to regain my humanity. All it took was getting to, you know, around 17 years old. Oh, a bit late there, Connor. But that's when I started to turn things around. And at this point, with my books, I had developed more strategies. I'd started to develop profiles for people, which made interacting easier. I now understood a range of emotions. I started to understand my own emotions much better. So actually, I was able to interact and I was able to talk about things. I could say when I was angry, when I was depressed, when I was you know, just slightly hurting, when I was miffed, when I was morose, that's a lovely word. So many different emotions were now at my fingertips because I had studied and I worked hard. And he knew this. He and I spent a lot of time talking, laughing, chatting, hanging out. I helped her with her relationships. I helped her fix things that went wrong. I continued my studies, I became the teacher's pet again, but I loved it this time. I helped out at the science club. I very much enjoyed what I got to do, and I had E to thank for it. Now, I was getting closer to my birthday. E and I actually share the same birthday, but a year apart. Kind of freaky, kind of cool, depends how you want to look at it. But I sat down with her, under the trees, under the picnic basket during one of our free periods, I looked her dead in the eyes and I said, e, what do you think about me being autistic? So many people in my life have left me because I'm autistic. And she quite simply said to me, I don't see you as autistic, I never have and never will. I see you as Connor and that is all you are to me. You are Connor, you are my best friend, you are someone I love with my heart because I choose to. The first person in my life who wasn't required to love me, wasn't required to care for me, had just sat there and told me they cared. I had a friend, and that is the day that I stopped writing my notes. 
That is the day I put a line under everything and I said, I don't need these notes anymore. Because to the one who matters, to the one who calls me friend, I am Connor, I am not autistic. And that's how I regained my humanity through that, which I must admit was a rather difficult process up to that point. When I finished school, I started working with a couple of local organisations, I continued onwards. I didn't go to university, still haven't yet, mostly because I am terrified of exams. That comes from the teachers, you know, back straight, look forward, don't ask questions. Mm. I like to ask questions, I'm a very nosy person. But I'd gone through this journey, and whilst I'd been going through this journey, some of the different things I had found, especially with my sensory issues, was the fact that people didn't seem to understand. One of the first things I find when I start getting sensory overload, and this is always entertaining, is I start to lose a bit of my motor control, then my eye focus starts going, then I start to feel like everything's underwater. Once everything's underwater, I know I have a very limited amount of time to get out of there. The further it goes, the more I can feel it encroaching. It's sort of, sort of like a wave pushing forwards, but this wave doesn't have a form. You can sense it, you can feel it, you can touch it, you can taste it, but you cannot see it, yet it's there. So as we're sat here, as you're sat with the people around you, if you look around, the person to your left, the person to your right, you then feel it closing in more. Instead of that person's face, it's now distorted, it's now clouded a bit, and then then it's encompassing. Now it's sort of shrieking. It's suddenly very bright, then very dark, then very loud, then very quiet. So you have to deal with that. You have to listen. And it becomes quite unpleasant. I have two minutes, one minute? One minute, right. In which case, I would like to read to you a little extract I've written, if you don't mind. So, a friend of mine introduced me to this idea called Dear Autumn. You basically write a little piece and it's supposed to be a letter, a pen pal. So it starts, Dear Autumn, I'm autistic but I'm also called Connor. It's been a while since I've spoken to an idea, a figment of my mind, a season or the passage of time. I used to talk to you a lot when I was learning who I was at least. As all I'd been told was I was autistic. I was now a figment much like you. My identity had been stripped away by a title or a generalisation, a piece of paper. I had forgotten in school as soon as I was given that diagnosis. People who once laughed with me now laughed at me. I may as well no longer have been Connor. I may as well have been autism, a label, a stigma. I'm still scared I'm seen that way, actually. After spending years clawing back what I believed once mine so completely and utterly, I'd never lose it, my identity. Maybe you're scared too, Autumn. Scared that your beauty and variety will be forgotten by a broader term, much like I may well be. Lately though, dear Autumn, I've learned. I've learned that I will always be different, but that's not a bad thing. I've learned that I can still love as I had, been before give, as I had before being given my label. I can love the same as anyone else. I've learned I am me, and that will never change. Dear Autumn, I am Connor. Autism does not define me anymore, at least not completely. Thank you.